1993, I didn't know what to do. I had gone to school to go in the ministry. I sent out 150 resumes, and nobody would hire me to be a youth pastor. That's all I wanted to be was a youth pastor. Nobody was offering me an opportunity. And a friend of mine said, you're just wasting your life. Go back to grad school and get a degree. And I hate school. And I went to grad school, and I was sitting in my first Greek class. Was it at 7.30 in the morning or something like that? It was an ungodly hour. And I started talking to this guy, and I was like, we talk alike. We have the same southern hick accent. <laughs> And it turns out that he grew up 30 minutes from, my mom, from where my mom and day, dad were raised in the mountains of Virginia. And we became just really good friends, he and his wife. After we graduated, he pastored a church in Chesapeake, Virginia that was almost 100 years old. And uh, he invited my youth group to come over, and we went out door to door. And we started witnessing, bringing people in off the streets. And that little church, it seemed like 150 or something. We packed it out every night. The Holy Spirit was moving people. And we were like, we had church. And just Hans and I have had that same love and passion for Jesus that's taken us both all around the world, has put us in ministries. And he is a dear friend. We don't get to see each other as much as I'd like. But he is an awesome man of God. He was in my wedding. We just have such a, a relationship and a love for one another, and love for the Lord. Would you put your hands together and give a warm crosswind welcome to my good friend, Pastor Hans Hess. Come on, let's give the Lord a praise tonight. Amen. Thank you, brother. Come on, can we do a little bit better than that tonight? It's so good to be here, and what, a, what, a, what an honor, what a blessing. I pastor in northeastern North Carolina on the coast, and uh, I did grow up in the mountains of Virginia, so I talk like an Appalachian hillbilly. But I'm in the south, right? So I can let it go down here, right? But anyhow, it's great to be with you guys tonight. Thank God. Thank God for the Spirit of the Lord I feel in this place. Thank God for the freedom to worship here tonight. Amen? John Absher is a great friend. I did meet him in a grad school, and uh, we would get to talking, and, you know, we would just, our language would just go right down, straight downhill. <laughs> We've got the accents, we'd get rolling and all that, but uh, you know what? You're blessed to have him as a pastor. He is a working machine. I always said about John, he's a worker, man. He really puts his heart into the ministry and he works it hard. He studies, he prays, he fasts, he visits. He, I mean, he administrates. And God has had him in some great places and great churches through the years. So I'm honored, John, to be here with you guys tonight. And I hope just to add to, you know, um, I hope just to add to the work that's going on here. I just want to give you a, a little bit of background of who I am. I've been preaching for 32 years. I began um, very young. And I got saved. I wasn't raised in church. I got saved in a little holiness church in the Appalachian Mountains and was set on fire for Jesus in that little church, baptized in the Holy Spirit. And I, I began traveling with a full-time evangelist and worked with him. My wife and I did music, and we've, we've always been very active in music. My wife was a Hammond organ player, so she grew up with tent preachers and miracle evangelists and all that kind of stuff. And uh, then I went college, went to grad school, and then got out and started pastoring churches. And so for the past 25 years, I've pastored. I pastored in Chesapeake, Virginia. I pastored in the Washington, D.C. metro area. And now I'm in a, a more of a rural town in northeastern North Carolina. But of all the places I've been, it was in that rural town where God exploded the church. We took a church that was running about 150 people, and it went to it went technically to 1,200, and we have two campuses, and uh, God has just really blessed the work. We've been able to reach the world from that, that small town called Elizabeth City, North Carolina, and God's just done some amazing things there. I've seen things that I only dreamed of in years past. Thousands of people being saved, being, being delivered, being set free, and it's just been a joy. It's been an honor. You know, there's nothing like serving Jesus, is there? 
There's nothing, nothing like serving Jesus and uh, seeing him transform lives. I wasn't raised in church, and so I know the story of a lot of folk who come in from the outside and they get saved, and uh, it's just, uh, I, I love, it never grows old to me to see a life changed. Amen? It never grows old to me. So, uh, hallelujah, I have two daughters who help me in ministry. They're great and they work in the ministry with me. They're in their early 20s. They both are married, and I have one little grandson, and that's the only, the only grandson we have thus far, and he's a year old. And last night, he was blowing me kisses on FaceTime. So I'm like, I'm done right now. I'm, this is it. This is, this is it. Amen? I do travel a lot. I work in the International Pentecostal Holiness Church, and I travel quite extensively preaching, and I've preached about five different camp meetings or pastors' conferences this summer, and there's something that, that I've found everywhere I've been this summer, and that is there are a lot of people in churches who are discouraged. There are a lot of pastors I've encountered who are really discouraged because you think about what we've been through over the past year, what, year and a half, we've been through a pandemic like none of us have ever seen in our lifetimes, right? We've been through uh, riots in our cities. My town was no exception to that. And then we had a political race that was as wild and contentious as any of my lifetime. And we've been through all of that, and some of us have lost loved ones, and we've lost people. Maybe some of you were touched by COVID. I came through COVID last December, and we, I've buried about four people in my church from COVID, so it's, it's touched us as well. So, you know, all I know is at the end of the day, we're still standing here. We're still, we're still the body of Christ, and we're still standing, and we still have a job to do, and I believe that everything the devil intended for bad, God's going to turn for his good. Come on, somebody. I believe everything the devil intended for bad, God's going to turn for his good. And I just was praying for your church tonight. And I just pray that this week shifts. I, 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 you guys seem like you're doing great. I mean, like, like you don't need, need my lecture here. But nonetheless, I was just praying, God, just shift this thing. Let it explode here, Lord. The Spirit of the Lord's here. Y'all are, are primed and ready. You're ready to do what God has called you to do. And I'm just, I just have a simple word to share with you tonight. If you'll open your Bibles to the book of Psalms, let's go to Psalm 126 tonight. Psalm 126. And this is a very familiar passage of Scripture, but I, I don't know, I ran across it in this summer studying through the Psalms, and, and it, it just it leapt off the page in a different way to me, okay? So Psalm 126 and let's just read the entire thing. I'm reading now the New King James, so let's just, it's only six verses. Then I'll go back and, and parse and, and pick my way through it. Psalm 126, when the Lord brought back the captivity of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are glad. Bring back our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. Or the NIV says, restore our fortunes like streams in the Negev. Those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Can you say amen? Come on, look at your neighbor tonight and say, keep, come on, say it out loud, keep moving forward. Turn to another neighbor tonight and say, keep moving forward. Recently, having come through COVID last year in our church and all that you guys experienced, we experienced as well, and numbers dropped off dramatically. I lost my wife to cancer last summer, and 
After that, I took nine weeks off from preaching. So we were in the height of COVID, and I lost my wife, and I didn't preach for nine weeks, and we were running only a small percentage of what our church normally would run on any given Sunday morning. And I finally came back, and we started plowing, and we started working to see this thing grow again. And at the beginning of the year, I had a friend come by who's a strategist who works with churches. And I was just always thinking, okay, we're, we're, we're here now, but everybody's coming back. Just give it a few months, and we're going to get back to 2019. Or we're going to get back to 2018. And then my friend who's the strategist, he's been traveling all over the nation working with churches, and he showed up and he said, Hans, what are you running now in church? I said, well, now... This is the number, but you know, before, he said, well, let's face it, what you have now is what you have to work with and just face reality. And that was really a wake-up call to me because I think I was caught in a temporary holding pattern where I thought we were just going to get back to normal and everything was just going to revert back to the way it was and we'd all just consider this a wash. But I realized that wasn't the case. That now we are in a new normal. That now we're in a new season. And I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing. Because in this new season, God has already opened up stuff that's blowing my mind. He's already created avenues for us to preach the gospel around the globe. Last Friday, I was sitting in my living room at my house on a Zoom call preaching the gospel in a rural village in Pakistan with women primarily in the crowd seated on the floor. And I preached the gospel and I gave an altar call for salvation. I bound and cast out every demonic spirit and then I started praying for the sick. And every time I do this, I receive reports of hundreds of people being saved, many people being miraculously healed, and God delivering folks in those meetings. That wasn't happening before COVID. But now it's like God has taken everything the enemy intended for evil and has turned it around for his good. Can you shout amen? So Psalm 126 is a psalm of ascent. It's one of the handful of psalms that we believe the Israelites sang on their way up to Jerusalem to celebrate the festivals. Three times a year, all males in the nation of Israel would be required to re report to Zion or report to Jerusalem and bring an offering and worship before the Lord. And then they would sing certain songs. And if you ever go to Israel and you go to Jerusalem, you realize it's in the mountains. So you literally have to ascend up to Jerusalem. These are also called the songs of ascent. You sing them as you ascend upwards. And so this is one of those songs, and we believe the context of this song came out of the deliverance from the Babylonian captivity. If you know your Bible history, you know that Israel was taken captive into Babylon. At least it, the, the northern kingdom was taken captive into Assyria. The southern kingdom was taken captive into Babylon. And then, after 70 years, a ruler named Cyrus came to power, and released the Israelites, and they were able to go back to their homeland, or at least a remnant of them were allowed to go back to their homeland. But when they got back, things weren't as easy as they thought they were going to be. Things weren't just a bed of roses. And this is the psalm that evidently is describing this transition of them coming back. So I just want to look at it, and let it be an encouragement to us tonight to keep doing the right things and keep moving forward. Notice the first passage here. Verse 1 says, When the Lord brought back the captivity of Zion, we were like those who dream. When we actually were released from Babylonian captivity, it was like, this is too good to be true. Is this really happening right now? Is God this good? Did He really perform His Word? And you know, I think the first key in moving forward is to actually look back 
and remember where God brought us from. Actually, to look back and remember where God brought us from. This is how they start in Psalm 126. Do you remember when God brought us out of captivity? It was like a dream. It was like too good to be true. Even the nations around us were saying, the Lord has done great things for them. Surely the Lord has done great things for us. How many of you can raise your hand in here tonight and thank God for something He's done in your past? Come on, how many of you can raise your hand and wave at me if you remember the day God saved you? I wasn't raised in church, but I, was, I got very sick as a 16-year-old. I was put in the hospital for a week. While I was in the hospital, a voice spoke to me. Not an audible voice, but a voice in my heart spoke to me. And I was into partying, and I was into playing in rock and roll bands, and I was kind of going on, on the wrong path. And a voice spoke to me, and this may sound weird to you, but the voice said, Hans, you don't have to party anymore. Yeah, and when I heard that, it was honestly like I was in a dark room and someone walked over and flipped the light switch on. And it was like, that's right. I don't have to do any of that anymore. And I went to, I went to my parents' house when I, once I was released from the hospital, and then another voice spoke to me, again, not audibly, but on the interior. And this voice said, the world is coming to an end, and you better get in church. How's that for a seeker-sensitive message? The world is coming to an end, and you better get in church. I didn't, know, I didn't know anything about the Bible. My mom taught me to pray when I was young, thank God. So I just knelt down, and I asked God to come into my heart, save me from sin, and let me not go to hell when I die. And, and how often did I pray that? Every day. Because I didn't know any better. Finally, I had a friend, and I remembered, I said, I've got a friend, and, and her parents attend church. And so I called her up, and I said, hey, would your mom and dad take me to church? And she knew me, and she said, Hans, my mom and dad would love to take you to church. And so I went with them to a Pentecostal church. I had no idea what a Pentecostal church was. And I walked in, and it was like I'd landed from Mars. And these folks were kneeling down praying. They were lifting their hands. They were shouting. I was like, what? And then I remembered I had a cousin, and we always thought he was kind of strange. But he was a Pentecostal preacher. And I said, well, I'm going to try his church. And so I went up a holler. That's... that's a legit mountain term. And I went up this holler, and on the side of a creek bank was this little wood church. And inside of it was a buck stove to heat it, wood floors, and two outhouses out back. And I got in that church that night, and they started worshiping the Lord, and they started singing, Glory, glory, hallelujah, you know. They started singing, they started testifying, they started speaking in tongues, they started running the aisles. I got scared half out of my mind. I'd been to see Ozzy Osbourne in concert, ACDC and Iron Maiden, but I'd never been anything this wild. Come on, how many know what I'm talking about? And you know what? Thank God for that church. I don't remember what was preached, but I remember what I felt and what happened to me that night, and I surrendered my life to Jesus, and I've never been the same since. Hallelujah. And I've told that testimony thousands of times the world around, and I'm going to tell it till Jesus takes me out of here. Hallelujah, because I love remembering what the Lord has done for me. Come on, if that's you, raise your hand and give him a shout in here tonight. You remember what the Lord did for you. Never forget it. Never stop telling it. I hadn't been in that church long, and my pastor knew I had a real hunger for the Bible and studying it. My pastor came to me one day, and he said, Hans, you're studying, and that's a good thing, but you need to be baptized in the Holy Ghost to really understand it. I said, okay, what is that? I don't know. So I started praying that God would baptize me in the Holy Spirit. And I prayed this for several months until finally it got to the point one night 
I, I, I knelt down to pray in my bedroom. And I opened the Bible to Mark chapter 16. It said, These signs shall follow those who believe. In my name they shall do several things. Cast out demons, heal the sick. But, but one of those little phrases is, In my name they shall speak with new tongues. And I said, Well, Lord, you said it right there. In my name they shall speak with new tongues. So I knelt down and I prayed. And guess what happened? Nothing happened. So I was like, okay, Lord, let's do this thing again. I read it again, prayed it again. Re I don't know how many times I went through that exercise until finally I was praying and a syllable or two came out that wasn't in English. And I got scared. And I thought, hold on. I don't want this to be my mind. I don't want this to be an evil spirit. So I'll just wait till church to get it confirmed by the preacher. <laughs> so the next time we had church, the pastor called an altar call, and I ran up front, raised my hands. He laid hands on me, and I fell out on the floor, and all of a sudden that, uh, those unknown languages just started gushing out of me, and I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. I think about that a lot when I get in a dry place or when I get in a difficult place. I think back when I maybe don't feel His presence like I want to. I think back to when He baptized me in the Holy Ghost and I realize that the Holy Spirit is still living in me just as powerfully as He did the night I was baptized in the Spirit. Come on, somebody raise your hand and shout hallelujah. Come on, how many can remember something God has done for you? I remember the great moves of God. My wife and I have chased revival for 25 years, and we've been in some amazing moves of God. I was in a church here years ago traveling with an evangelist in Tampa, and I, I don't know that I've been here since. And that was about 25 years ago, and, and we ended the meeting one, that night with every single person face down on the floor, prostrate before the presence of God. I've been in the services where I've seen gold dust. I've seen... Gold teeth appear. I've seen the glory cloud come in. I've seen the lame walk, the mute speak, the dumb, uh, the dumb speak, and the, the, the deaf hear. And I've seen uh, all kinds of crazy miracles. Hallelujah. And I think back, back about those times when I get dry or when I think God's not moving or maybe somebody's trying to tell me that God doesn't do those things today. I just think back of all the miracles I've seen. Come on, can somebody shout hallelujah? I think about my wife who was suffering with shingles, which is a nervous condition, you know. She was suffering with shingles, and she was and tormented with this. And, and one night, her parents were going to go to a revival meeting in West Virginia. And she said, well, take me. And they loaded her up in the back of a car and drove her to this revival meeting. And she got in the meeting, and the preacher stood up and pulled out a handkerchief and said, God spoke to me tonight that whoever runs up to the altar and grabs this handkerchief, he's going to heal. And my wife got out of her chair, ran all the way up, grabbed that handkerchief, and God instantly healed her of shingles. I think about the time my, my mother-in-law and my wife had a friend come and visit. Her husband brought her because she had breast cancer and dropped her off at the door and said, I'll be back after her when she's healed. Three days later, they called him and said, she's been healed. She went home, they loaded her up, she's still healed to this day, and that's been probably in the 1980s. Come on, somebody. How many knows that God has done awesome things in our lives, and we should celebrate and never forget the goodness of the Lord? Hallelujah! First thing is remember what He's done. But if we stay in the past, it's not good you got to move it on up to the present and ask God to do it again. Notice the next verse, verse 4. says, bring back our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. What's he talking about? I, you know, in the King James, this reads weird. Bring back our captivity, like come back and, and let us be in bondage again. But that's not what he's saying. He's saying, do it again, Lord, as in the day when you released us from captivity and do it suddenly like the springs that burst forth in the Negev desert. 
So in the Negev, it's super dry and it's desert and it's arid, but there are times when rains will come seasonally. And when they come, they'll just overflow. We kind of have that thing in coastal North Carolina. You probably have it here. When it rains, the water has nowhere to go. It just floods. Uh, They're saying, Lord, now do it again like you did in those days. Do it again like you did when you released us from captivity. Do it again, Lord. How many can lift your hand and say, do it again, God? Do it again, God. So this church obviously had revival at some time in the past, right? 1980s, 70s, 90s. How many can lift your hand and say, do it right now, God, in 2021? And how many can lift your hand and say, God, and do it greater than you've ever done it before? Come on, because I don't think God comes and does things on a small scale. He's going to come and bust the, the paradigm of the past and do it in a more powerful way. How many believe that? Hallelujah. I'm pastoring a church right now that's 102 years old. 102 years old. And I know that they had moves of God in the past. They had great pastors in the past. And when I came, I thought, what can I add to this, man? What can I do? But you know, God has come in, in, in our time and has shown up and blown it wide open, I think greater than they had ever experienced before. And it's a church that's over 100 years old. So can God do it right here in this church in Tampa, Florida? Come on, preach with me a little bit tonight. How many believes God can do it right here through you, through you tonight? Hallelujah. Come on, hallelujah, y'all have already taken the lid off and you've welcomed in the Holy Ghost and you've welcomed in miracles, signs, and wonders. That is what this nation desperately needs. Jerry Vines, a great Baptist preacher, said we're headed for one of three things. Number one, we're headed for ruin and moral decay as a nation. Or we're headed for revival. Or we're headed for the return of the Lord. One of those three things... Well, I think all three are coming. Moral decay and ruin is coming. But I believe the return of the Lord is coming as well. We just don't know when, but I'm expecting Him any time. But during the meantime, I want to believe God and push for revival to happen so when He does come and when He does crack the sky, that we're not found lazy or asleep or drunk, as Paul said, but we're found working in the harvest field and we have something to show for our labor. Can somebody shout hallelujah? So I encourage you, just like John, don't throttle the power of God in this church. Let it flow through you. Let it flow through you. If you've never been filled with the Holy Spirit, ask God to fill you. If you've been filled with the Spirit, ask God to use you in the gifts. Ask God to use you in signs and wonders. Ask God to use you in the word of knowledge and the working of miracles. Ask God to use you in tongues and interpretation. Ask God to use you in prophetic word and word of wisdom. Ask God to use you in casting out demons. Lord knows there's enough of them in this nation. Come on, ask God to use you at Walmart. Ask God to use you at Target. Ask God to use you at the grocery store. Ask God to use you in your local community. Come on, somebody shout hallelujah. Come on, the gifts aren't just for church. God has given us the power of the Holy Ghost so we can go out and take our neighborhoods so Florida can be saved, so the United States of America can be saved. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap of praise in here. Come on, give him a hand clap of praise in here tonight. I was traveling years ago with an evangelist. He's a great man of God, and he's preached for 50 years. And he said he was praying one time, and he said, God, what are you going to do with America? Are you going to bring ruin? Are you gonna, is it just going to decay? And he said the Lord spoke to him and said, no, I'm bringing revival to America. And he showed him the map of the United States and then superimposed on top of it came out of fire the words Jesus saves. And he said he's starting it on the coastal regions of the East Coast. 
and he's sending it all across America. That was years ago, and I remember that. That's why I believe I'm on the coast of North Carolina right now. Thank you, Holy Ghost. And how many know you're here for a reason? Hallelujah. And I believe it's to see God do it again. We're not to sit still. We're not to be discouraged. We're not to quit on the job. We're to go forward and see God do what he's called us to do. Come on, he's raising up a church in this day. He's raising up a remnant church. He's raising up a church that loses intimidation and loses fear. He's raising up a church that's willing to go and do everything he says do. Oh, hallelujah, I feel it in the Holy Ghost tonight. Some of you are that church right here. Some of you are going to be used in miracles and signs and wonders. Come on, hallelujah, hallelujah. My God, I feel the presence of the Lord in here tonight. I dare you to raise your hand and give him a shout and give him a praise. Come on, say it with me. Lord Jesus, send the sweeping move of God one more time. Remember the past and celebrate it, but right now pray, God, do it again in our time. Do it again in our time. Do it again. In our time. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Do it again in our time. I don't know, John, why I'm on this. this is, I just feel stuck here. Do it again in our time. Do it again in our time. One of my closest friends in all the world is a guy named Kent Christmas. And I preached for Kent just recently at his pastor's conference, and he's coming to be with me next week. And Kent said back in 2018, he said, the Lord's taken the lukewarm out of the church. And I heard that word, and I'm a thinker, and I thought, Lord, that don't even sound right. Come on. That doesn't even mesh with my understanding of grace. And, and then COVID happened. And every pastor I talked to, said it's like God washed out a lot of the lukewarm, but he's bringing back people that are on fire. He's bringing back people that are hungry. Hallelujah. 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 We may not have the numbers I had before COVID, but my church right now, it's like fire in that sanctuary, like you guys tonight, just like fire. Oh, hallelujah. Thank God you held on. Thank God you're still standing. Can somebody shout amen? I said all that to get to the sermon tonight. He says in verse 5, then he comes to this. Why does he come to this? Those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Why that? What's going on? Here's the situation. I never saw it like this before. It's a, it's a metaphor. It's a word picture. They're saying, Lord, do it again and bring back our captivity. Bring back the deliverance from captivity. And Lord, we'll go forward and we'll keep sowing seed. We'll keep moving forward. We'll go forth sowing seed even though the circumstances aren't right for it. So the metaphor is of a farmer with his leather seed bag over his shoulder. And he's going out and he's anxious and he's nervous. He has a trepidation in his spirit because he doesn't know if this is going to work. This isn't right. The season doesn't feel right. But he goes out anyhow and he keeps sowing seed. And he says he does it in three ways. First of all, he continually sows seed. That means there's no stopping and I don't know, I'm just going to bring it down home. Sowing the seed is us continually sowing His Word. 
that we got to preach it when our family doesn't understand it. That we got to preach it when the nation is contrary to it. That we got to preach it when the culture rejects it. That we have to preach it when it isn't popular. That we have to preach it when it's difficult. That we have to preach it when it's hard. That we have to preach it when people don't like it. Oh, come on, somebody shout with me in here tonight. That we got to preach it when things look dim. And we got to preach it when the going gets tough. And we got to preach it when the storms are coming against us. And we got to preach it when COVID is raging. And we got to preach it when the Delta variant is coming. And we got to preach it when inflation is looming. And we got to preach it when the stock market crashes or when the stock market goes well. We got to preach it when folks show up or when folks don't show up. We got to preach it if they watch online or they're not watching online. My God. God, I feel like preaching in here tonight. We got to preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Paul told Timothy, hallelujah, reprove and rebuke with all long suffering and doctrine. Come on, stand to your feet and shout, Lord, I'm going to sow. Come on, shout it out. I'm going to sow no matter what it looks like. Come on, turn around, high five somebody. Say, I'm going to sow no matter what it looks like. Hey! Come on, you can be seated. Second thing, you got to sow, and sow is the word, and sow is sowing doctrinal word and truth. Because, you know, I've been kind of sucked in in a lot of. I, here, I'm just going to. I'm just, I don't know, I feel raw tonight, so y'all just hang on. I feel that the American church has spent the past several decades learning how to do church in a culture that wasn't hungry for God. And so we tried. We have innovative pastors and innovative leaders who tried every way in the world to get a crowd. And some guys have been brilliant at that. But unfortunately, some segments have stopped preaching doctrine and have stopped preaching hard truth. And because of that, we have some churches, I think, filled with Christians that's never had a move of God. I was on a Zoom call the other day in Pakistan, and before we went live, I realized I was on there with a major Assemblies of God pastor that I've admired and respected for years from the West Coast. And I thought, oh my gosh, I'm on with this guy. And he was talking, and he said, you know, our problem is We've had so much seeker-sensitive church that we've had young Bible college students come up and work in those churches, and now they're becoming senior pastors of churches, and they've never seen a move of God. They've never seen the Holy Ghost move at an altar call. They've never seen someone shake and shimmy under the power of the Holy Ghost. Never seen a demon cast out. Never seen someone baptized in the Holy Ghost, maybe. My God, I don't know why I'm saying this. But anyhow, I think it's time that we preach and preach doctrine. Thank God you have a pastor that's committed to it. Come on, somebody shout hallelujah. And then he says, not only do you continually go and you sow the word, but then he says you do it weeping. And the the picture is the farmer is going out and he doesn't know if it's going to work. He doesn't know if the crop's going to bear. The times were more difficult when they came back from Babylon than they anticipated. But they kept sowing anyhow and kept sowing through their tears and through their anguish and through their anxiety. I'm telling you folks, Charles Haddon Spurgeon said, Tears are the liquid prayers of the Christians. Weeping is not a sign of weakness. The strongest men in Scripture wept. You think about Moses who wept. He's standing there at the Red Sea crying. And God responds and says, why are you crying to me? Stretch forth your rod and and do what I called you to do. Later on we see the great men, Jeremiah and Isaiah and different ones weeping in the Old Testament. Even Jesus himself. The Bible tells us in the Gospels that Jesus wept three separate times. The first was when he went to Lazarus' tomb. He heard his friends came and told him his best friend Lazarus had died. And the Bible said Jesus wept. 
But he didn't stop there. He got up and he dried his tears. And he walked all the way to Lazarus' tomb. And then he shouted, Lazarus, come forth. And the man came out of the tomb in the grave clothes, risen from the dead. And I love John's account of it. Because over in the next chapter, he's sitting around the table eating dinner with them. Second time Jesus wept as he went up on the Mount of Olives. And he looked at the city of Jerusalem. And he saw the city and he wept over the city that had slain the prophets and rejected the prophets of God. But he didn't stay there in his sadness. He got up and he dried his tears. And he braided a whip and he walked through the Kidron Valley on the Temple Mount into the temple courts. And he cast out the money changers out of the temple. And then the final time was in the Garden of Gethsemane. When he's praying until his sweat becomes his great drops of blood. And he says his soul was in great anguish and sorrow. But he didn't stop there. He got up and he walked right into the house of Caiaphas. Then to Pilate's house. Then to Herod's house. And all the way to the place of crucifixion. And thank God he didn't stop there because he gave his life for you and I on the cross and purchased our redemption and purchased our salvation. Can somebody shout hallelujah? It's all right to cry every now and then. It's all right to work through the anguish because God's going to perform His Word. You get up and you dry your tears and you keep moving forward. You get up and you dust yourself off and you keep moving forward. Those of you who've walked through hard times, I'm going to give you a Bible promise. If you keep moving forward, you're going to reap if you faint not. Come on, somebody raise your hand and say, I'm going to reap, hallelujah. You're going to reap if you faint not. For those of you who've been through a dark time over the past year, I'm telling you that weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. I'm telling you, those of you who've suffered loss and suffered disappointment, if you hang on, he who endures to the end, the same shall be saved. Oh, hallelujah. Somebody get, you, get this in your spirit. My God never forgets. My God has a register in heaven. My God is not on the short-term plan. God is on the long-term plan. Maybe all you can see is the storm, but I know a God who walks on the storm. Maybe all you can see is the battle, but I know a God who's won every Every battle, maybe all you can see is the drought and all you can see is the dry. But I know a God who sends the rain. Hallelujah. Maybe all you can see is COVID and all you can see is the Delta variant. But I know a God who is Jehovah Shammah. He is Jehovah Jireh. He's Jehovah Shalom. He's my healer tonight. Come on, somebody. Maybe all you see are empty pews. Friends who haven't come back to church. But I serve the Lord of the church. I serve the God who's going to come. Hallelujah. Riding on a white horse with tens of thousands of his saints and wrap this whole thing up. I don't know about you, but why don't you stand on your feet and give him about 30 seconds of your best praise tonight. Come on, shout it out loud. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, just shout it out. God, we're going to make it. Come on, shout it out. I'm not quitting. I'm not turning back. I'm not giving in. I'm not going back. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. One more thing, and we're going to pray tonight. You can be seated. One more thing, and we're going to pray. So my wife and I traveled for 25 years off and on, you know, we pastored for 25 years, we traveled for 28 years off and on doing revivals and seen some of the greatest moves of God and her healed miraculously. We've seen, this cra- we've seen people healed, we've seen people saved. We, it, it's absolutely amazing. Then last year, actually in 2019, I was preaching a camp meeting on July 4th in Tennessee and we were getting ready to leave the next morning and, and my wife bent over double in pain. And we didn't know what was going on. We just started praying. I just held her and prayed. And after a while, she said, Hans, you're going to have to take me to the hospital. And for my wife to say that, it's bad. So I took her to the hospital, and we spent that night, July 4th, we spent in the hospital. 
and they couldn't find out what was going on. They, they ran all kinds of tests, and finally I just drove her home the next day. Over the subsequent months, she got, you know, she started feeling something wasn't right. Went, eventually a doctor found that she had a tumor. And we, found, we, we felt that everything was going to be okay. All the blood work was coming back looking fairly good. She went in for surgery, and when she went in for surgery, they found it was an ovarian cyst, or an ovarian tumor, rather. And cancer had spread, you know, already. They got it all. We thought we were fine, came into 2020. She started chemo and did pretty well on chemo and then started having difficulties around April, I think around April. Went back and had a PET scan and found out the cancer had shot all through her body that it was a super aggressive form. And then I buried her July the 2nd, or she died July the 2nd. So um, my world was absolutely shattered because we had done everything together. John can tell you she was a phenomenal musician. And we'd, we had 29 years of musical repertoire together. She was my greatest supporter. She was a, a giant in the faith. And I thought, okay, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? I'm a faith preacher. I preach healing. I've laid hands on thousands of people for healing around the world. How am I going to do that anymore? What, what am I going to do? Am I, even, am I going to pastor again? Am I going to quit? And so I just took some time from my church. I was working some in the office, but I didn't preach for nine weeks. And I didn't know it, but I found out later that even some of my church, they were asking my daughters, is your dad going to come back? <laughs> is he coming back or not? And eventually I came back, and I fought, it seemed like, every thought possible. And finally I just said, devil, I'm not stopping. I'm not quitting, I'm not turning back, and I'm going to be your worst nightmare. I'm going to make your life miserable till I leave this place. And I'm telling you, church, it put something in me, even though it was a bad deal, it put something in me greater than I've ever had in my life not to quit, not to give up. Hallelujah. 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 And then I walked through, just recently some folks lost their loved ones to COVID. And in a way I've never been able to as a pastor, I, I came alongside them and I said, you're going to make it. You're going to be stronger because of this. And God's going to work this out for your good. If you trust him and you don't quit, you're going to come out of this. Come on, somebody. And my friend Kent Christmas, he came to my wife's memorial service, and he prophesied over me, and he said, out of great suffering comes great anointing. Out of great suffering comes great anointing. Some of you have been through some stuff. I don't know your stories, but I guarantee some of y'all have been through some stuff that blow our minds. And I'm here to encourage you. You use that. You use that, and you don't quit sowing. Even though you cry and it doesn't look like it's going to work out all the time, you know what the promise is? The promise at the end of this is? That they who sow in tears shall return with joy. That's the promise. And they who continually sow in tears are going to come back carrying the sheaves or the fruit of their labor on their shoulders. That's a promise I'm hanging on to, church. That those of us who walked through something over the past year and a half, we're coming back with joy. We're coming back with fruit. We're coming back greater than what we went into this thing with. Can somebody shout hallelujah? Come on, just go ahead and lift your hand and say, God, I'm coming back with more. 
I'm coming back with more joy. I'm coming back with more victory. Come on. I'm coming back with more fruit. Come on. I'm coming back. Hallelujah. I'm going to give the devil a black eye out of this, and I'm coming back. Come on, he thought he had us down, but it only made us stronger. He thought he was going to take us out, but it just fired us up more. Hallelujah. How about jumping up on your feet and say, God, I'm not quitting. I'm going forward in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, brother, your best days are ahead of you. Come on, raise your hand. Your best days are ahead of you. It's like I see a veil, be it like a curtain being pulled back. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And I'm here, a new season is coming, my friend. In the name of Jesus, John, lay hands on him right now. Come on, church, stretch your hands toward our pastor friend. In the name of Jesus. Come on, pray out loud. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. God, we give you praise. We give you praise, God, for new season. Hallelujah. That he's coming out of this in Jesus' name stronger. In the name of the Lord. Come on, every one of you, who you want to go into the next season and you want to walk in with victory and you want to leave that past behind you, but let it strengthen you to the next season. You want to come back with joy and come back with fruit. Why don't you run to this altar tonight, hands uplifted as they lead us in worship and just spend some time at the altar. I'm going to go and minister to folks as you come tonight, but I'm just going to believe God to inject joy into this house tonight and into your life. Hallelujah. We're going to leave the sorrow behind us and we're coming forth with joy come on hands uplifted tonight father we give you praise in this house come on hands uplifted father we give you praise hallelujah 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 god we give you praise we give you honor hallelujah 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 Come on, everybody praying out loud. Come on, hands uplifted up here. Hallelujah. God, we give you glory. God, we give you honor. We give you praise. We give you honor and praise. still stands great is your faithfulness faithful in the name of Jesus right now I declare healing miracle over your life I declare a new heart right now in Jesus name God give her a new heart tonight give her a new heart restore all the damage of the stroke and give her a new heart tonight heal them Receive it in the name of Jesus.
Come on, folks, let's believe for miracles tonight. Come on. God, do a miracle in Frank's life in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, in the name of Jesus, God. Listen, if anybody needs to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, I want, we want to pray for you tonight. If you'd come up front here, I want to pray with you. You never received the baptism in the Holy Spirit. I just want to believe for you tonight. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank God for what he's doing right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, some of us turned the corner tonight. We're not going back, right? Hallelujah. We're not going back. It's like when you see the finish line. You run the race, you see the finish line. You're like, man, I'm not stopping now. <laughs> it's in sight. I used to race motorcycles. You see the end, you break your neck to get to the end. Come on, we can see it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God, I give you praise. I give you praise. I give you praise. Come on, touch the person next to you. Touch them on the shoulder right now in the name of Jesus. Father, I just pray, God, Holy Ghost, strength into that person on my left and right. In the name of Jesus, God, that you minister right now, God, into their life. And, Father, God, you do your work. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And, God, you minister to them in the name of Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. God, we just, we just cast down all discouragement tonight. All discouragement has to go in the name of Jesus. And, God, I just pray joy comes and replaces it. God, just joy comes right now in the name of Jesus. God, you restore laughter, Lord, in the name of Jesus where there's been tears and sorrow. God, you just restore laughter. Hallelujah. Joy comes in the name of Jesus. When they go home, Lord, let joy fill their houses. Hallelujah. Let joy be upon their children. Joy be upon their spouses. God, I give you praise, Lord. Hallelujah. Let their countenance transform after this night. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 God, we give you praise. We give you praise. We give you praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, let's sing it again. Hallelujah. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. 
It's hard for us to understand how God works. When I was in Bible school, my sister was pregnant with two twin babies. And our whole family was excited because this was my parents' first grandkids. It was their 
my first nieces. And they were born and they only lived a day. They were born premature, their lungs hadn't developed and both of these children died. And my sister had lived for God her whole life. She grew up in church, she got married, she had her children after marriage. You know, she said, I did it all the right way. Why did God let my babies die? I think about Pastor Hans and, and Jackie. I've known them almost 30 years. I've been in their home. They've been in my home. We've preached together. We've worshiped together. We've done ministry together. And never had I been around a couple that was just so full of the love of God and the power of God. And you don't understand why. We all believed that Jackie would be healed. We all believed that that my, my nieces would be healed. We believed that I even went to their grave and commanded them to come out of the grave in Jesus' name. And they didn't. We don't understand sometimes why God does things or allows things to happen. Because I've seen other people healed. I mean, they weren't even thinking about getting healed. And they, they just stand up and be paralyzed in half their body and they'd be totally healed. And I don't understand. Well, God, why'd you do it for that one and didn't do it for this one? And didn't do it for this one. And, and you did it for this one. And you just sit there and, and, and you go. And you have to be like Job who said, even Though he slay me with my last breath, I will praise him. His wife said, Job, we've lost our children. We've lost our home. We've lost our crops. We've lost our finances. You're covered in boils. Why don't you curse God and die? And sometimes I felt like that because I'm not perfect. I make mistakes. I've hurt people. People have hurt me. I fall, I mess up, you mess up, we fall, we have all these difficulties, we have all these challenges, and sometimes you just want to say, I give up, it's a lot easier to be on the highway to hell than it is on the narrow path to heaven. But I remember what Job said, he lost everything, he's covered in boils, he just wants to die. And he says to his wife, yet with my last breath, I will praise him. No matter what hell you're walking through today, no matter what problem you're facing, no matter what discouragement is hitting you, no matter what failure has come into your life, no matter what disappointment. I love that verse. Pastor Hans, thank you for that word. I know the psalmist David penned it thousands of years ago, but those who sow in tears are going to reap in joy. They will reap with joy. So, Lord, do it again. Do it again, the work that only you can do in our lives. Do it all again, only the work that you can accomplish in our hearts. God, you put this church in this city as a center of revival almost a hundred years ago in 1926. And Lord, that same fire that started then still burns today. And God, our better days are ahead of us. The best is yet to come because Lord, we are here waiting on you to move. God, I thank you for every home, every family, every person here tonight. Pour out your blessings upon them. Fill them with overflowing in the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Can you just uh, express some appreciation to Pastor Hans for bringing the word tonight? He'll be with us tomorrow night. You need to be here and bring a hundred of your closest friends because they need to hear the word that's going forth here and experience what God is doing. God bless you as you leave tonight. If you're able, please give an offering to help with the expense of the revival if you can. God bless you. We'll see you tomorrow night. Please take your children so that my wife can go home. All right. God bless you guys. Have a great evening.